This video is on particle physics, the particles that make up matter. Proton, neutron, electron, you're familiar with those particles. Proton and neutron found in the nucleus, and electron in discrete energy levels about the nucleus. Each three have antiparticles, and the antiparticle has the same mass as the particle, but opposite charge. And of course, uh, we found out with beta positive and beta negative dec decay, uh, that there are two other particles, the neutrino and the antineutrino, and they were predicted by Einstein and Dirac and uh, later discovered. And rounding out the particle model by 1930 was the photon, and uh, it was seen as a particle because of the uh, photoelectric effect. And this is where light of, uh, of various energies were shone on uh, metals and just like particles colliding with other, par other particles, the photons collided with electrons and bumped them off the metal. So this is the picture by 1930, the particle model. Okay, all these particles are pretty small. How do we detect them? Well, one, one way to detect them is using what's called a bubble chamber, and it's a chamber filled with liquid uh, hydrogen. When particles fly through this area, they ionize liquid hydrogen behind it, creating sites where gas forms, and you can see the gas, so you can see the track that the particle takes. We also use a, an external magnetic field, and that will um, create a force on the charged particles, causing them to bend, and the non-charged ones will travel in a straight line. So here you have a track uh, going from left to right. It's a particle, clearly it has zero charge because it's traveling in a straight line. Uh, but the next particle, again traveling from left to right, shown in red, it is a charged particle, and using the right-hand rule, the magnetic field lines are going into the page here, so right-hand rule tells you that this must be a charged particle, a positively charged particle, in fact. And this red particle actually decays into uh, two other particles, so at the end of the track, you'll see it become the blue track, and since it's going clockwise in this case, it must be a negatively charged particle, and another particle going uh, counterclockwise, which means it must be a positively charged particle, the green track. Again, this positively charged particle decays into um, looks like three other particles here, one that goes straight through the middle, one that goes uh, clockwise, uh, which would be negatively charged, and one that counterclockwise positively charged. So this is a simulation of a bubble chamber. They don't actually, tracks don't look like this in color, but this one's a little easier to follow. Uh, but Google bubble chamber and you'll get some images of some, of some real bubble chamber photos. O oh, matter most common. Yeah, just about everything on Earth is made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, and neutrinos, the more elusive particle, but they're in there too. Uh, of course, we can, we can create much more exotic particles, and we do this uh, in uh, particle colliders by throwing particles at each other. We can create new particles. And, you know, the most common particle collider would be LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. And here we have two proton beams, and protons are traveling at high speeds and collide with each other. Well, Einstein's energy mass equivalence, E equals mc squared, says you can convert energy into mass, and that's what's happening here. Um, the faster they're traveling, the bigger, the more mass of the particles we can generate. But we've generated thousands of new particles this way in particle accelerators. Okay, down at the particle level, we get into a topic of physics called quantum mechanics, which is very non-intuitive. Some very strange behavior uh, happens at the particle level. For example, uh, particles like electrons and photons behave both like waves and particles at the same time. You'll recall some of the uh, wave-like behavior. Waves reflect and refract and interfere. Um, particles collide and pass momentum from one particle to another. Um, so you're going to see some effects of both of these from both particles. Okay, here's an example. Uh, from the left-hand side of the screen, you see plane waves of light coming in and passing through two slits, and an interference pattern forms. So you see dark and, and bright fringes. Um, this is something that's common to waves. Water waves will do the same thing. Sound waves will do the same thing. Yet, and this is certainly uh, the wave effect of light in this case. Um, another physical phenomenon involving light, here's a photon shown in green coming down and, and bouncing an electron out of a metal. It's called the photoelectric effect. 
and certainly that photon passes over momentum to the electron and makes it hop out of the metal. That is a particle-like behavior uh, of light. So two phenomena, light behaves like a particle and a wave. So all of the particles that we talk about in particle physics can behave both like waves and particles simultaneously. Heisenberg's principle indeed is very, very non-intuitive. Frankly speaking, I'd call it bizarre. But you can see it at work. Suppose I have a laser beam here, and I use laser beam because that's right, but I could use any other light for that matter. And I make here an opening, a slit, a vertical slit. And here goes the laser beam right through the slit. Light goes on, light goes on, and here I project this onto this wall or screen, projection screen, and what do I see? Well, you see exactly what you predict. You see here this laser spot from this beam. But now I'm going to make this vertical slit narrower and narrower and narrower. What well, now are you going to see? Well, you're going to see exactly what you predict. You're going to cut off the edges of the circle, and the spot gets narrower and narrower and narrower. But now you come to the point that this narrow slit, say, is only one hundredth of an inch wide. And now Heisenberg's principle comes in. Because now you know so precisely in the horizontal direction where the light is, that as it emerges from this slit, the direction of the light is no longer determined according to Heisenberg's principle. And so now what you're going to see, it's going to spread out in the horizontal plane, and therefore what you're going to see on this projection screen is going to get wider. Extremely non-intuitive. Because what am I doing? I'm making the slit narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. And what do you see ultimately? That the beam horizontally becomes wider and wider and wider and wider and wider and wider and wider. Now that is very non-intuitive, but it's the way the world works. Yes, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, very odd, unintuitive indeed. Uh, nature insists that we can't know with any uh, infinite precision the momentum and the position of a particle and likewise energy and how long a particle lives the time of a particle um, so for instance in the in the energy time pair if we know uh, quite well the mass energy of a particle so we know that with great precision then the precision with which we know how long it lives will won't be very good in fact that product must be less than um, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi it must be greater than Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So here's where Heisenberg's uncertainty principle comes into play in particle physics. Uh, in the question of when particles interact, there often seems to be a violation of the conservation of mass energy. It seems that sometimes particles appear out of nowhere and, and we're gaining mass energy. Um, well, because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, as long as those particles don't live for too long, and you actually, there's no way of observing uh, that imbalance of mass energy. So as long as uh, E times T, the energy times uh, the lifetime of the particle, is less than H over 2 pi, then there's no way you could have observed that energy. There's no, no physical way that one could observe that energy therefore no violation of the conservation of mass energy. Okay, we're going to look at the periodic table here for physics. It's called the standard model. Here's your first generation of particles. This is the up, the down quark, and the electron neutrino, and the electron. Then your second generation of particles. Again, two more quarks, the charm and the strange quark. Then they have, you have the muon neutrino, another type of neutrino, and then the muon. And your third generation of particles starts off with two more quarks, the top and the bottom quark, and the tau neutrino, and then the tau, also called the tauon. 
Uh, and then your your fourth generation here are actually what we call charge carriers, or sorry, force carriers, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, the quarks are shown in ping up, pink up above, and these six particles are quarks, and the six on the bottom are called leptons. And then on the far right, you have your bosons. Again, this is the standard model, and all matter, every matter you know, can be made up of these elementary particles. Many of the elementary particles in the standard model carry electric charge. Up, char, uh, sorry, up charm and top quark have a charge of positive two thirds. Downstrange and bottom, negative one third. All the neutrinos have charge zero. Electron, muon, and tau on, negative one. Photon has zero charge, gluon has zero electric charge also, uh, Z boson zero, and the W boson positive one or negative one charge. Now protons and neutrons are made up of quarks. Uh, here's a proton and a neutron. A proton has two up quarks and a down quark, and a neutron, two downs and an up. And of course, we can get the charge on both proton and neutron by adding up the charge on uh, each of the particles, elementary particles within them. So for the proton, we got two thirds and two thirds, and then minus one third gives us a total charge of plus one. And similarly for a neutron, when we add up third charges, we get a charge of zero, and that certainly agrees. If you've heard of the Large Hadron Collider, hadrons are made up of, of quarks, and you've got two different classes of hadrons, baryons, these are hadrons that are made up of three quarks and mesons, two quarks. And in the baryon category, you'll recognize proton and neutron. They're both made up of three quarks. And there are a number of others, many others that you don't know of. Same with mesons, lots of mesons. And here are some examples. Okay, let's use your knowledge of the standard model and elementary particles and have a closer look at beta negative decay. There's carbon-14 going to nitrogen-14. And uh, you'll notice that it's actually a neutron that changes to a proton here. Uh, but looking at what a neutron and proton are made up of, up and down quarks, you can see that it's really uh, a down quark that changes to an up quark. And in that process, it gives off an electron and an electron antineutrino as well. So that's a better look at uh, particle, the beta negative decay, uh, shown in yellow. It's practice problem time. Get out your pen, piece of paper, and try this question out. Uh, an omega particle uh, is comprised of three strange quarks. What is its charge? Okay, time to pause review and give this question a try, and we'll look at the solution. And the solution, a uh, strange quark has a charge of negative one-third, so you have three of them. Three times negative one-third gives you negative one, and that's the charge on an omega and it's written omega negative one. Okay, we'll look at practice question number two. Write the equation showing the elementary particles involved in the beta positive decay of sodium 22. Since it's beta positive decay, we start off with sodium 22 uh, and we're producing um, a positron, so an E plus one. And so that tells us when we balance the mass number and the charge that this must be neon atomic number 10. And of course, in beta positive decay, what's also produced is a, a neutrino. This is an electron neutrino in beta positive and negative decay. And of course, um, what's happening here is we've got a, a proton changing to a neutron. And a proton and neutron are made up of quarks, up, up, and down quarks. And so we can see that it's really an up quark changing to a down quark. And that gives off a positron and an electron neutrino. And that is the elementary particle uh, reaction showing beta positive decay. Okay, question number three. Uh, the momentum of an electron is known to within 1 times 10 to the negative 27 newton seconds. What is the greatest precision to which the position of this electron could be determined? Okay, Heisenberg uncertainty question. Pause your viewer, pencil and pen, and try this one out. And here we are looking at the solution. Uh, we're going to start off with, actually tricked you a little bit here. We gave you the 
the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for energy and time. Here it is for position and, and momentum, very similar. And of course, H is Planck's constant, 6.63, 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. And so maximum precision occurs when uh, delta P delta X equals H over 2 pi. And now we just solve for uh, position, which is delta X. And we get delta X equals 1 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. So that's how precisely you could know the position. There's no way it could be measured any more precisely than that.